Can you hear me, Kathy? Hi, everybody. Let me know if you can hear me. All right. Thanks, Kathy. We'll get started here in a second. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for telling me where you're from. All right. It's 1.01 p.m. in Montana. 301 Eastern Time. Um, thank you all for joining me here today. My name is Nancy Seiler. I'm a golden working artist with Golden Artist Colors, and I use a lot of watercolor paint, and um, I use Core e exclusively. And um, this Core mini set I'm going to unbox today is my favorite for sure in my nature journaling practice. And I am. Um, interested in watercolor quite a bit and also um, plants. I'm especially interested in plants. I'm a classical botanical illustrator and I'm just fascinated by going out and seeing the different um, plants in the different states such as bud and leafing out, blooming, and going to seed. So I tend to do a lot of nature journaling with plants and I'll show you some examples in my nature journal about that. So today we're going to be unboxing the Core Mini and I'll, I'll show you um, what I like about it and we'll go into each pigment. There's 12 pigments in the box and um, it's just a great little set and we'll talk about that a little bit more. So let me know if you have any questions as we go through this and Kathy Jennings at Golden Artist Colors is a core watercolor specialist, a materials application specialist. And so if you have any questions um, that I don't get to because I'm busy on the table here doing some swatches and so forth, Kathy will answer those. You'll see a lot of links for some specific articles and pigments um, that Golden has on their site and core colors have on their site. So uh, Again, my name is Nancy Seiler, and we're going to unbox the Core Mini. So, but first, we're going to unwrap it because I thought that would be fun right now to have um, to show how this is a, such a great gift. Um, and with the holidays coming up, you might want to consider this for yourself. Give yourself the gift, and wrap it up like this, <laughs> or give it to a friend. So, um, again, my name is Nancy Seiler. Here's my website. Here's the Core Colors website if you want to get on there and take a look at some of the videos and, and um, pigments and so forth. And then if you have questions afterwards, you can always email help at goldenpaints.com. So let's get started. All right, so I thought it'd be fun, like I said, to wrap this up. So I'm going to just unwrap it and unbox it. Found this fun ribbon out in my studio. It's always fun to open a present, even though I did it for myself. <laughs> All right, so here's the Core Mini. This is how it comes, and it's a wonderful little box. It's got the swatches on the back and it opens up to show you what it looks like inside. There's plenty of uh, mixing areas which I'll go into here. So let's try to open this up. All right. Now sometimes when you open the Core Mini, um, pull this out, kind of tighten there. There it is. Fun. Here's the brochure. So, box. 
and it comes with a little brochure that talks about core in particular and why they're different from any other uh, watercolor on the market because of the binder. The binder is what adheres the pigment to your paper. So Core's binder is call, called Aquazol, and it's been around for quite a long time, and Golden thought that since it was so different and so resoluble, and the colors were so bright with the binder that they decided to make it into a watercolor available to you. And it's different um, than gum arabic in that core doesn't um, crack, it doesn't yellow, and it's um, very flexible. So the binder is very different, and you'll see that as I paint out the swatches. In the core line, there are 83 um, or 80 pigments and three iridescents. And I tend to use a lot of the iridescents, iridescent gold, pearl, and silver, if I'm painting bugs or butterflies, and it's great for scales. But there are, like I said, 80 colors. And in the core mini, um, when you open it up, there are 12 pigments. So, um, when you open this up, you don't want to flip it over at first until it gets dampened because these might pop out. They're a little bit loose in there because they're hardened pigment, but they're very resoluble. So we have the 12 pigments. We have two yellows, an orange, two reds, a purple, two blues, a green, two browns, and a, a Payne's gray. So. Um, I'll go into these in more depth. So this little set is only um, three and a quarter inches high by four and a half inches wide by only five eighths of an inch deep. And as I mentioned, it's got wells for mixing up here. And this is all in here. This is non-staining silicone. So you can see it's bendable or flexible and it wipes up very clean. Here's a palette that I've been using for a few years and you can see that it cleans up really well and the pigment has settled into some of the areas here so you can see the letters on here a lot differently A through um, L A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L and that um, um, correlates to this little mixing swatch where you can actually take each of these paints and paint out a swatch sheet so you can see the pigment a lot easier than in the tin and I use this um, you know to refer to the pigments but I also use the core mini um, mixing guide that I have taken off the internet and I think Kathy will put a link up there for you if you want to do the same thing. What I did was I captured this image and I um, printed it out on photo paper and then I laminated it. So I have this in the back of my journal and I can refer to it really easily for nature journaling when I'm out in the field um, by holding it up to you know a bug or something that I might see or trees or sky and I can easily mix that without doing too much um, testing. So um, anyways, so getting back to the core mini, here's the, you have two mixing areas, 12 colors. It comes also with a little um, piece of nonstick parchment kind of paper where um, I tend to leave this in here so that if I put, if I carry my swatch around in this, it won't stick to the paint. So you can decide to keep that in here or not. Um, let's see what else. It's got half pans, so there are 12 half pans in here, and they're refillable. So if you start using this, this up, like I'm starting to use up a lot of my ultramarine blue right here. Can't really see that that well. But for instance, here is the core um, nickel azo yellow in an 11 mil tube that you can buy um, separately if you use up your colors in here and um, 
easily fill these tins back up, these half pans back up with this paint. So you won't need to buy a new set if you use this up. You just can refill them. So that's wonderful. Um, I wanted to mention too, just as an aside, that uh, Golden offers this gripper, G-R, G-R-I-P-R, I believe. And uh, it's really great for getting the lids off of all of all of your different tubes of paint. It even has a really small um, version down here at the end that you can get those really tiny lids off your paint. So something uh, to think about for not only your acrylics, if you use acrylics, but those little watercolor tubes. All right. Um, so let's paint these out. Let's see if we have any other questions. Um, I'm going to take a look over here. All right. Great. Okay. Looks like Kathy's answering all those. So I'm going to go ahead and paint out some of these um, swatches. And then I'll show you some of my nature journaling examples. Um, again, getting back to the gift idea for nature journaling, all I use in nature journaling are a, a flat brush, three quarter inch flat, and a eight round. I use the eight round a lot. And this is a Princeton Velvet Touch brush. This one is a Princeton Elite three quarter inch wash brush. So couple different brushes, and then a mechanical pencil, really simple. And I also use a Micron 01 um, permanent non-bleeding ink for my, my close work. So just those, those um, supplies in a Moleskine journal. So we'll get into that in a little bit. So let's go ahead and paint these out. All right, so the first one I want to show you is the Cadmium Yellow Primrose. Let's see, get these all in one place so you can see them. And I'm going to go ahead and use my wash brush here. And uh, I'm going to put a little bit of water down on the paper. So I have some area where it's wet into wet and some area where, where it's um, wet and uh, wet into dry. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull some paint off of this hardened um, core and show you how resoluble it is very quickly. I'm going to get quite a bit of pigment on here. And show you cadmium yellow primrose. And this would be a yellow that is biased toward green. So I mentioned you have two yellows, two reds, and two blues. And each one of these primary colors leans toward the secondary color on, the, um, on your mixing palette. So I've got um, a kind of a green yellow, which leans toward green. So cadmium yellow primrose, it was inspired by the flower of, of Western Europe, the primrose. It's semi-transparent and staining, and it's kind of a cool yellow, as I mentioned, biased toward green. And you can mix this with phthalo blue, green shade, to make very bright greens. So um, let's take a closer look at this. And yellow is a little bit hard to see. When we get into the deeper um, hues, you'll see it a little clearer. So I'm going to put that aside. Um, I do want to show you that this is, um, like I said, semi-transparent and staining. Um, most of the colors in this set are modern colors, and that's why they're called core modern watercolors. Modern meaning um, most of these pigments were made in the lab. They're organic pigments or um, made through organic chemistry, not that they're organic from the earth. That's a lot of times we see that. We hear that organic means like, you know, organic lettuce from the market. But in this case, it's organic chemistry. So 
a lot of these pigments are made um, in the lab and they're milled very, very fine. And that's why they are so bright and vibrant because of the way they're made. And we'll get into that again, like I mentioned a little in a little bit. So the next pigment I want to talk about is nickel azo yellow. And nickel azo yellow is transparent. That's what this open box means. And you'll see that on your, um, uh, your little uh, brochure that Golden has. Um, you can order a brochure like this if you need to with all the pigments and all the um, pigment um, index, color index name, the chemical description, and light fastness ratings. But down here is where I was talking about these different um, little symbols. So this means it's staining. So nickel azo yellow is again a modern pigment. It's made in the lab. It's transparent and staining. It creates rich amber glazes. You can see that it's a little bit brighter um, without the camera even, but uh, it's brownish yellow at full strength. And then you get some nice ranges up to a bright sunshine yellow. So let's take a look at that one. And I'm painting on a Fabriano 140-pound cold press paper. So I'm going to get a little water. And you can really see how that is so resoluble right away. I'll load up my brush with pigment. And you can see how rich that is. And I see Kathy's posted an organic and inorganic pigment list, which is actually really fascinating. I've been doing some research in the last few days uh, for this Facebook Live, and it's just really fun to read about the pigments. So you can really see how deep that is and then how nicely it, it gets brighter even because of the undertones. All right. The next one I'd like to talk about is transparent pyro orange. This is a secondary color, meaning it's between yellow and red on your color wheel. So yellow and red make orange, but look at how vibrant this is, this pyro orange. It's a transparent and staining pigment. And it's a deep orange with vermilion qualities. And again, this looks pretty red on the screen, but it's actually quite orange in person. And you can mix this with the quinacridone magenta to get some really nice reds. So you can see here is the pyrrole orange, transparent pyrrole orange. Here is magenta, quinacridone magenta, which I'm going to show you here in a second. And then look at all these different reds you can make with those two mixtures. Beautiful color. All right, so let's uh, let's paint that one out. I see Julia says nickel azo yellow is possibly her favorite color. I'd have to agree with that. That's one of my favorites. But once you try a lot of these other pigments, you're going to have a hard time deciding which is your favorite pigment. All right, here's pyro transparent pyro orange. Get a lot of pigment on there. Oh my gosh, look at that. That's gorgeous. All right, so you can really see how that moves. It's staining. It's a staining pigment rather than a granulating pigment, such as ultramarine blue is more granulating, which we'll get to. But wow, I love, I love seeing how vibrant that is. And so with these modern watercolors, the milling, and that's what makes it so vibrant, yeah, because it's so fine. Boy, I don't hardly want to put this one away. I want to keep watching it. But I'll put it aside for now. 
and we'll go on to pyrrole red medium. All right. So this has excellent light fastness. So rather than maybe a cadmium red, which isn't as light fast as pyrrole red, um, this is a uh, very clean, bright red. It's semi-transparent and it's also staining. So let's take a look at that one. I have a feeling it's going to be move a lot like the transparent pyro orange. All right. And again, you can see how resoluble these are so quickly. Okay. Beautiful, huh? Man. And again, you can, um, this is a red that is biased toward orange. So it's a more of a, a warmer red than what you're going to see with uh, the um, quinacridone magenta coming up. So wow, take a look at that. And we might take a look at these in a little bit and see what they've done moving. The next one's quinacridone magenta. And again, this is the one I mentioned that you could mix with the pyro or the transparent pyro orange to get some beautiful reds. So you can see that painted out right here. The quinacridone magenta um, is very transparent. You can see it's transparent and very staining. Staining. So again, a, a beautiful organic pigment, synthetic, made from quinacridone in the lab. So let's paint this one out. Let's see if you have any more questions. All right. So here is oh, quinacridone magenta. Such a beautiful bright color. Nice. And this is a red that leans toward violet on your color wheel. So if you want to get some really bright violets by mixing, you'll want to mix the quinacridone magenta with the um, phthalo blue green shade to get some really bright violets. So you can really see how that moves into the wet areas. I'm really liking how this is looking under the camera. It's so bright. Oh, wow. So dioxazin purple. This is a very strong pigment. You only need a little bit of this. A little bit goes a long way. It's semi-transparent and staining. It's a very deep bluish purple, and it almost looks black up here because it's such a strong pigment. And then you can see the undertones are more lilac, and you can get some really bright, um, nice... Uh, colors with this. You can also tone down the brightness of other colors by using a little of this axis in purple. But again, a little bit goes a long way, so I'll show you what I mean by that. Okay. I'm going to really put a lot of pigment on this brush just to show you what I mean. You can get a beautiful violet using Quinn Magenta and Ultramarine Blue, as Kathy mentioned as well. So look at how strong that is. It's crazy strong. So see it moving. Beautiful, huh? And I'll come back to these as well. Okay, ultramarine blue. This is a pretty common color. Most of you have heard about, I'm sure. And this is a um, granulating color pigment. You can see in this swatch, hopefully, how it granulates, which means the pigment sort of um, washes out of the binder a little bit so you can see a um, 
granulation here, which is quite different from the phthalo blue green shade, which is coming up. You can see the difference. So ultramarine blue was originally made from lapis lazuli, which is a metaphor, me, metamorphic rock. And um, it's from the Latin ultramarinus, which means beyond the sea. And that's because it was imported from Europe and Afghanistan. Imp sorry, imported to Europe from Afghanistan. So lapis lazuli, lazuli was found in Afghanistan. And um, the synthetic ultramarine pigment was invented in 1826 and became really popular in the 1830s. So this is a, again, a modern pigment. Um, Kathy, maybe you can put the mixture on there for me. We were, Kathy and I were talking a lot about um, organic and inorganic pigments. And a lot of these pigments I'm showing you, a few of them, are actually a mixture of um, organic and inorganic pigments. So um, to make them a modern pigment, which means made in the lab or synthetically. And you can correct me on that if I'm not explaining that exactly right, Kathy. It gets a little complicated when you start really learning about pigments. All right, got a lot of ultramarine on, or a lot of water on here, so I can pull up a lot of ultramarine. Now, ultramarine, um, it's not as strong of a pigment as dioxazin purple, or the pyrroles, or even the quinacridone magenta. So I tend to really load my brush in the, with this to show you a comparison. Um, but let's take a look at this. You can see it's not as strong, but it's a beautiful um, deep blue. And it used to be a very fine color, um, uh, meaning when they used the lapis lazuli, because it was hard to come by. And so a lot of religious paintings with the Virgin Mary, um, she, she was done in blue, wearing blue, and that was to show how um, rare and important it was. So you can see in here a little bit with the granulation, but it doesn't move as much as what you'll see coming up on phthalo blue, green shade. All right. It's a single pigment. All right, Kathy. Thank you. Single pigment that is synthetic and organic contains no carbon. Yeah, we were talking about how um, so with Kathy, was it um, organic pigments? Inorganic pigments have no carbon, right? So inorganic means in the earth or from the earth. So when I show you the um, the umber coming up, that's from the earth. So that's inorganic or in the earth. Um, organic pigments, synthetic inorganic. So organic pigments don't have any carbon in them. Is that right? I think it is. Okay. Anyway, I don't want to get too technical with this. So phthalo blue, phthalo blue green shade. So this, again, is biased toward green. It's a semi-transparent and staining pigment. You can see the nice range of color it has. It's a brilliant blue, isn't it? And it's great for glazing. So let's paint this one out. And this is, again, much stronger pigment, higher tinter than the ultramarine blue next door. So take a look at that. See that moving? It's very staining, very strong pigment. Thanks, Kathy, for clarifying that. If you want to get into pigments, there's some good um, books out there. Um, lots of information on handprint.com, too, that Kathy and I were talking about yesterday. 
So you really want to get into understanding pigment. Take a look at some of those links. Now, sap green. All right, so this is an interesting color. Um, this was traditionally made from buckthorn berries, and it is a uh, transparent and staining pigment. And it's now made with a, a mixture of synthetic pigments. There's a little bit of phthalo in there too, as well as some nickel azo and um, iron oxide, I believe. So this is again made in the lab. It's much, um, it's not, it's light fastness is one, which means it's the highest light fastness. If you were to use um, historic sap green, it's very fugitive. So you wouldn't want to, actually use the pigment made from the buckthorn berries because it would fade. So this is a much um, better light fastness. So let's take a look at this one. So this is a secondary color that's in your set between um, the blues and the yellows. This would be your secondary. And I mix a lot of greens, but this is a nice place to start um, with a green. If you need to do some leaves, you can actually uh, tone it down or brighten it up. So let's load up the brush with some sap green. Wow, nice. You can see you can get a nice deep green with it. Nice range. That's kind of cool, isn't it? Whoops, there we go. All right, a couple more and then I'll look at some uh, questions and show you some journals. All right, transparent brown oxide. This is a, a really nice um, brown. It's a rich gold brown and it really adds a lot of warmth and transparency in your darker values. So it's a transparent and staining pigment. It's also granulating. So hopefully you can see that. Yeah, you can see a little bit of the granulation there. And it's a, it's a clean and strong mixer without dulling your mixes. And if you put a wash down, it's kind of peachy looking. You can see that down here. So let's paint that one out. So someone asked here, Diane, isn't it similar to burnt sienna? It is, but the undertones are much uh, stronger. And this is because it's a modern pigment. A burnt sienna is a mineral pigment. It's from the earth or inorganic in the earth. This is made in the lab and uh, it's, you can get a really, um, a little bit brighter, stronger pigment than the mineral pigment. So it's more transparent than a, um, than a um, burnt sienna. See a little bit of the granulation there. All right, two more. Burnt umber, natural. And this is kind of like the burnt sienna in that it is from the earth and it originally came from Umbria in Italy. That's why it's called umber. So you can see that it is um, um, se uh, semi-opaque, uh, semi-staining, and granulating. So there's a granulation on there. You can see that pretty well on this burnt umber. So uh, again, it's a little bit more um, opaque. So when you heat raw umber 
it becomes burnt umber. So this is basically raw umber that's been heated up and it, be, it becomes warmer looking. And uh, this pigment, burnt umber, was used by Rembrandt and Caravaggio, um, mostly during the Baroque period, I believe. And um, Vermeer also used umber for shadows on whitewashed walls. So if you see that color coming up in some of those paintings of Vermeer, that is umber. So this is, again, is from the earth. It's a mineral pigment. Let's see how it looks. And you, you can see that I really loaded the brush, but it's just not as strong as the one before it, the transparent iron oxide, which is a modern pigment. But this is a beautiful brown. It's nice to have an earth pigment in the set to um, get a larger range of, say, greens. By mixing blues and yellows with burnt umber, you can get a really beautiful range of greens. I also um, can mix burnt umber and ultramarine blue or burnt umber and um, phthalo blue to get a nice black. So blacks are much better mixed than using like a carbon black at, right out of the tube because they're richer. So that's pretty beautiful, isn't it? I keep saying beautiful, but they're just beautiful. I can't help it. All right, one more. Paint's gray. So paint's gray is uh, named after a watercolorist named William Payne, and uh, he painted in the 18th century. So paint's gray is semi-opaque and staining. And this is a nice alternative to black. It's less intense as a black mixing color. So if you want to deepen um, a mixture, you can add some Payne's Gray and it will really deepen it, your mix, value-wise. So originally when um, William Payne mixed this up, it was a mixture of Prussian blue yellow ochre and crimson lake but our mixture is a little bit different than that all right let's paint this one out all right really see that moving Look how deep that is but it looks like black here but you can see the undertone is some of that blue comes out and even I can see a little bit of yellow you may not be able to see them on the screen but I can see a little bit of warmth in that as well so that's Payne's gray okay so I'm gonna put these aside to dry a little bit and um, put my set up here. And I, I just want to show you a few examples from my journals. Um, and like I mentioned, this, this would be um, a wonderful gift for someone, for yourself. <laughs> I tend to do the most shopping during the holidays for myself when I'm shopping for other people because I don't usually shop. So when I'm out there, I'm like, oh, I might get one for myself as well because that's so cool. So here's a few examples using the Core Mini. Um, these are just full page um, layered watercolor of areas around where I live. This is way up high in Goat Flat. It's um, about 10,000 feet. Some nice low vegetation. So sometimes I'll take a little um, template and do a little landscape. It's not as overwhelming as doing a whole page. So you can take a business card even and draw around the business card and do a little watercolor quickly. And again, I use the Micron point, or sorry, it's an O1 Micron with a fine tip to do some writing in here. And then I've got a little praying mantis I found out there. Here's a vertical landscape. You can turn the page and do something more vertical. 
more writing. These are what I had out when we started, some bugs. So, you know, in the winter, we're getting lots of snow here in Montana, and um, and uh, I tend to go to the Montana Natural History Center, you know, half a mile away, and I can look at their bug collections and go and draw and uh, get out of the cold. So that's one way you can keep nature journaling during inclement weather. This is done in California. I, uh, I go down to San Diego usually and do uh, lecture demos for Golden. Um, this coming year, I'm not going anytime soon until COVID lets up. But this is Palm Desert. So you can really do some fun little studies in your journals. Um, in the back of here, there's a little pocket. And that's where I usually put my mixing chart handy and any other kind of mixing charts or templates that I use regularly and then I could just move them out of the current journal into the new journal when I fill it up so there's one let's see I think I have a couple in here I wanted to show you again this is uh, around here in Montana I've been just local haven't gone anywhere for a while but these are just little studies with the Micron Pen and then the Core Mini. Just really easy to take with me. You can see nice layered colors there. And you can do also do a, a large landscape across here. This is one I just did. Haven't really finished it yet, but just some um, fun little pine cones and rose hips, rose leaves, other shrubs and and uh, Engelmann spruce and dug fir pine cones that I'm going to go back in. It's kind of fun to get a field journal out and go back in and add information about what you've seen. And then one more. This is, uh, I took this down the Grand Canyon, down the Colorado in 2018 and was able to do a few um, sketches you can really see the granulation and the ultramarine there and then a couple other sketches with the core mini see how nicely it blends all right so i'm going to switch back um, to the other camera here and um, oh so the, which brand of journal do I use? I use a um, Moleskine. So let me switch back. Hi, everybody. <laughs> my daughter cut my hair the other day, and I look like a Dutch boy. So um, anyway, let's see. What brand of journal do I use? Um, I use a Moleskine journal. So I just, I put a sticker on here from my trip, but this is a wonderful little journal. It's got... Um, I'll show you the pages in here. It's you want to when you're painting, you want to have a stiff paper for painting. You don't want anything too thin, like a drawing journal, because it's going to buckle. That water is going to water media is going to buckle your page. So you want to make sure you have. This is a watercolor notebook made by Moleskine, and if you go to my website nancyseiler.com. Under materials, under sorry, under workshops, there is a link with materials, and it's got a link to Moleskine. It's got a link to the Micron pens. It's got a link to the core paints, the brushes. So you can just go to my website and take a look and, and link to those items. And um, again, a watercolor notebook. So I use the journal, a mechanical pencil. I used to use a drawing pencil and a, and, a, and a bigger eraser and a sharpener, but I realized most of the work I could do, I could just do with a mechanical pencil, which has an eraser in the end and a, like a 2H lead and easy and light to carry around. And then I usually just take this uh, Princeton brush out, again, the number eight round, and the Micron pen. I like to paint with a brush, and so 
Um, I have a little Nalgene bottle that I put water in. And I also have a sock, an old tube sock that I cut off. And I can have this on my wrist and clean my brush instead of having a paper towel. So this is handy. Not my idea, but I got it from somewhere. Um, so that's all I, I use when I go nature journaling. Let's see what else. Do we have any other questions? And again, I can't scroll back up, so I'm hoping um, Kathy's answered most of your questions. Um, so one more thing I wanted to mention that's behind me here. Um, these are these are little nature journaling pieces. Let me switch the camera, and I'll and I'll um, finish up here in a minute. But these are um, just cradled boards, birch panels, and I've taken. I'm using um, Fabriano, 140 pound cold press, and doing some nature journaling on these, and then I mount them with soft gel onto the board and then I can just hang them up. So something different. Um, let me show you these items. This is the five by five birch cradled panel. Pretty inexpensive. This is the soft gel gloss that I use to adhere the paper to the board. And always use a acrylic brush. Don't use your good watercolor brushes. This is just a real basic, um, it's a Princeton brush company, but um, nothing fancy. You don't want to use your good watercolor brushes with acrylics. And then what I do is I mount that onto the board with soft gel. And then I varnish it. I varnish my my art with golden gloss and satin archival spray varnish. You do not want to use a brush varnish on your watercolors because it will smear them. So I usually use two coats of gloss varnish, letting it dry in between each coat, and then two coats of satin varnish. So what the var the gloss varnish does is keep it keep your paint really bright doesn't dull it down and then the satin actually brings your painting back to look like a more of a watercolor. So um, that's an option for actually mounting watercolor on board. Let's see. Good. And Kathy's posting some some links about how to do that. And let's go back through these and take a look. Right. Haha, <laughs> this is kind of fun. Oops. All right, so here's um, cadmium yellow primrose. No, the spray varnish won't hurt the watercolor paint or make it run. No. Test it out though, always test it out first. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention about core was that you can mix core watercolors in with the watercolors you already own. There's no problem in doing that. So, um, definitely can mix them together. There's your transparent pyro orange. Look at that. Wow, that's cool. Pyro red medium. Your quinacridone magenta. Gorgeous. Dioxys and purple. Look at that beautiful, how that ran and stained. Okay, ultramarine blue, that's your granulating pigment. You can really see the granulation in here. And those granulations are just beautiful. Some, some artists really like that granulating. Thalo blue green shade. This is again a staining pigment, very transparent or semi-transparent. 
Oh, wow, look at the sap green. There's a lot of granulation in this one, too. Interesting. Got my, I have a dog that's shedding like crazy right now, so I apologize for the black dog hair. Okay, and there's your transparent brown oxide. Burnt umber. And finally, Payne's Gray. Oh, there's your Payne's Gray. Look at that. Huh. And then, uh, actually, finally, Nicolazo Yellow. Look at the bright range on that. Okay, I'm going to switch back to my camera. All right, so. I hope that um, you got something out of this Facebook Live and that you'll think about this little core mini. It fits in your back pocket, actually. Um, you can carry it around in your purse with a brush and a pen, a little water, and you're set. You can also get a little moleskin journal that's about this big. They actually would be about the same size as this and carry it with you. Um, are there any other questions while I'm still on? We've got about a couple more minutes. I really appreciate you joining me today. Again, I'm Nancy Seiler. Um, I'm a golden working artist for golden artist colors. My website is nancyseiler.com. I'm gonna go ahead and post on my blog. Um, if you go to the website, you'll see my blog, and I'll post some of the tests today that we did with the, with the pigments on my site there, so you can take a look at them again. This will be up for a couple um, months, so you can go back and watch it again. Um, if you have if if you have any questions, you can again ask them here or go to help. Let's see if this is going the right way. Help at goldenpaints.com or visit the core colors dot com website. So thanks everybody. I hope you got some uh, good information out of this and um, go ahead and treat yourself with a, a nice gift this holiday season with the core mini. Thanks a lot and I will hopefully see you again soon. Take care.